Ms. Epler Wood to the podium. Thank you, Jessica. And I have to say it's a unique and fun honor for me to be giving this keynote. I think it's the first time I've ever given a keynote in a place where I regularly visit. <laughs> <laughs> so um, some of you I've gotten the chance to meet and I had met Jessica at the State House and uh, another player in your world, Bob Billington, who is a wonderful player in the world of sustainable tourism, has brought me to Rhode Island more than once over the years. So I'm glad to be here. I'm from Burlington, Vermont, if you didn't hear that. And so I've often found visiting here how many of uh, local kids go to UVM. And so you know, I just feel that there's a lot of connection here and I really look forward to sharing my expertise. We did have the chance of doing some town hall meetings virtually, which I found great uh, uh, to help me understand where you're at at this moment. My job right now is very interesting and very challenging. So if you feel as if things are changing uh, a lot for you on the island, you are not alone. I will be uh, talking about some international cases for you so that you can get a sense of what's happening in other places too. Uh, because there's a lot of change going on in my field right now. So that's why I'm calling this Sustainable Tourism 2.0. I've been in the field from the beginning, uh, which is really in the late 80s, um, and so I've seen a lot of change, but I would say that this is one of the most important times of change that we've seen. So I would say, you know, with, with this kind of change comes opportunity, and my research really recommends that you do see it that way, but it does require change in order to harvest that opportunity. So. Um, first, I wanted to just give you some quotations from your uh, virtual town hall meetings uh, because they give you a sense of what you yourselves have been saying. Um, certainly, you are not alone again that you want to rethink tourism right now in many cases. Um, there's this pervasive feeling that I think a lot of you could relate to of not having control over the number of people that are coming. Um, many people spoke about the inadequate services, especially in transport and waste management, um, congestion in downtown traffic, and overburdening uh, the police rescue and emergency services. We also, you know, really heard the strong and not surprising to me the role that your nonprofits are playing. I, I am a member of the Historical Society. I have myself used the Historical Society as a source of information. And I do understand why people go there, but uh, they spoke about how they've become an information center. Well, that's really interesting and it's an opportunity, but at the same time, it's a risk because how can they handle that? Uh, so the sense of reaching a limit, and then of course, everyone knows about the property. I'm also very sorry I never invested myself six years ago when I see the pricing now. Um, and the need to uh, address housing as a result. That's always many, many tourism destinations, in fact, all face this. And especially, of course, many are facing these increasing prices. We are in Burlington, too. So you suddenly see this gap, you know, this income gap. And I know many of you are worried about the equity that that, that will create, the problem of you know, the haves and have not. So, so those are very complex issues and we're welcome to talk about it as much as you like. So in, in general, uh, sustainable tourism 2.0 is, is responding to the challenges of tourism <coughs> growth. Um, the original definition, uh, which I was involved with in the 1990s, came uh, with the fact that tourism was more of an opportunity than a risk, I think, to us at that time. We really wanted to, and we saw throughout the world, that tourism was bringing revenue to people that really needed it uh, in places where they wanted to conserve their natural resources around the world um, and also create better well-being for local people. So really, and that idea, of course, of benefit for future generations comes with all forms of sustainable development. It requires us to think long term. We can't do sustainable tourism if we're thinking short term. Let's just put, you know, these, you're tonight, I'm gonna present you more information than I usually do in a keynote. 
I'm going to tell you this. It's a little more like a Harvard lecture than a keynote because so many good questions were asked to me during the town hall meeting. So I wanted to, if I overdo it, I'm sorry, but you gave me a little bit of encouragement to give you more details. So I think you'll see how these challenges are um, quite complex and you won't be able to solve them quickly. But that doesn't mean that they can't be solved. So let's get into it. So. Some of the other part of Sustainable Tourism 2.0 comes from, of course, the gigantic downturn of uh, tourism in this time period. Now, my understanding is, is that your downturn hasn't really been all that bad, but in most places, it's catastrophic, um, between 70 and 80% downturn in tourism destinations around the world. So you guys aren't exactly feeling that, but on the other hand, that downturn has actually made people say, wait, we don't want to go back to the way it was before. So that, even I wasn't expecting that. So what it's done is, you know, it's made people in destinations say, wait, we want to rethink here. And I'm going to give you some examples of that now. So, you know, when tourism hit its, you know, highest point in the world in 2019, um, it was already creating anxiety and you probably have heard the term or over tourism. Uh, it's, I've gotten into lecturing more than I ever have before worldwide uh, because of this anxiety. Uh, suddenly, you know, I've been traveling a lot to Europe, to Canada, uh, to major destinations like Banff, Edinburgh, Copenhagen, you know, to speak about this problem. Um, and it's because of that anxiety. People are like, Wait, wait, this is not what we want. And so one e current example, which I, my, my, another side of my family is from Honolulu, so I like to follow that as well. Um, they had protests there. Um, it was that uh, very serious. People did not want to go back to the way it was, and they have demanded change. I just read a new article on, on it you know, hours before I came here, they are completely redesigning their tourism management program as we speak. So it's quite a, a big example. But over, and I took part in a virtual forum online in July, and I got to hear people speaking about their, I would call it anger in that case. They, they didn't want business as usual to come back. They wanted to reclaim their markets. They wanted to reclaim their natural areas. They essentially wanted things to go back to what they consider to be a more normal way of life. And then Amsterdam, Holland, it's I think another relevant example. Um, they had a real problem because so many parties were coming there. With all of these cheap flights uh, to, in Europe, uh, bachelor parties and bachelorette parties, uh, really became inexpensive enough that you could do them anywhere in Europe and, and Hall and Amsterdam was a really popular spot for that. And so local people uh, really said, we don't want this in our neighborhoods anymore. And so they set out an ordinance that just passed this summer. They did a, a uh, they actually uh, petitioned their city council uh, they did a massive petition drive and demanded that they change their ordinances. So this has happened. I would call it experimental, and I'm not an expert on this ordinance. Uh, I, I myself would have to be more informed to tell you all its details, but because they have to set out a cap, they, they decided, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend this, but they set out a cap on the number of visitors but they're doing it a year in advance. So it's based on you know, working with the travel industry and making sure that the whole industry complies, including the airlines, with how many people are going to come in. Now that's, I'm giving you this example because I just want you to know how much people are looking to change, all right? I'm not saying I recommend this, but I will give you some examples later on what I recommend. So. Um, I think that's a lot of pressure for you, uh, you know, uh, here. It is everywhere, but you're a small group of people. Uh, and so you have even more on your shoulders. But I must say, 
I'm very impressed by how all of you accept that responsibility and how well you speak about it in the town and how all meetings and how organized you are in your thinking. So I'm very optimistic for you. I think you're going to be able to think this through. But it does require a change of thinking. Uh, how do you balance the, the sort of economic growth part of the equation uh, with environmental protection, equity, and local well-being? So here's just a, a you know, I think it's a, something from the literature, but I like it uh, because it gives you a different framework within uh, how to think about what, you know, what is central to your interests now. This isn't just about any one party or any one set of stakeholders, right? It's about all of you. So your well-being and, and the inclusiveness of what you want in your place, Block Island, is, look, is at, at the center of this uh, equation. I think that's the number one. Now this is a very prestigious organization that put this research together, so I, I tend to work with them. I find their research to be very, very good. And this is what they're talking about now for reframing the equation. You have to and will have to think about aligning your plans with what's called net zero greenhouse gas emissions. These climate action plans are now going to become increasingly important, if not compulsory. They're not compulsory yet, but I'm involved in international circles, many of whom are going to Glasgow, many of whom are already saying tourism <laughs> will have to measure its greenhouse gas emissions. So that you also, of course, and I know you're meeting about this, you're going to have to strengthen your climate resilience. Um, you're already working on this. You have a lot of things covered, really. You're reducing your biodiversity law loss, and that is an incredible accomplishment for Block Island, really incredible. Um, and I congratulate you on the work being done there. Um, innovation and building on behavior changes is what Jessica is really talking about for her campaigns. She's trying to begin to instill through the Tourism Council a different sense of what you do when you come here and why, how to behave. It's a very difficult thing to do. It's not an easy thing to achieve, but you know the, the idea of doing it is very important. And then ultimately, you have to think of your tourism industry as not just hotels um, and say, you know, transportation. It's your food economy, which again, you are doing very well with. I had farm to table breakfast and dinner here. Of course, this is a wonderful place to be, and I often come here because of the terrific food. Uh, so you have to look at that supply chain and how to make sure that that's fitting into the larger efforts. So these are big, big things that you have to consider. So the question will always be, how are you going to know if you're even succeeding? This is difficult, believe me. Um, so my recommendations are beginning to start here. You have to have a policy engagement process so that you can revise your tourism management system. You don't have a tourism management system now. Right? You, most places don't. So when I stand before audiences in Copenhagen and Stockholm, they don't either. So don't feel like you're way behind. What's happened is, is that from the 1950s forward, tourism was always managed as just an economic growth opportunity. That's it. But that's why my book is called Sustainable Tourism on a Finite Planet, because we've hit these tipping points throughout the world. And so the management system, it's, an, it's a trillion dollar industry, multi-trillion dollar industry, and it's going to take time, but that's the way you have to think about it. And you're going to have to have more science-based data so that you understand when you're reaching those tipping points, or else you'll never know, right? And, and then you just get into a lot of heated discussions without having the evidence that you need. And that you really want to avoid that. I think Hawaii's already kind of gotten to that point. That people were really just very heated, very upset. You know, just or in Amsterdam too, I think. You know, they're just like, stop this. You know, we don't want this anymore. I, you're not at that point, which is terrific. Uh, so you need to get ahead of that curve. So this comes out of you know my research. 
long before we even started hitting these tipping points, of course, I had the great opportunity to teach these students from all over the world at Harvard, and they started reporting back to me about all the problems they were having in destinations around the world. And that's when you know we really started to put this together, that we had to connect the consumption of, of resources to the tourists. Right now, we have no idea how much tourists consume. So what do I mean by that? This is classic benchmarking. You have to have what they call indicators and that you have to understand in order to know when you're going over your limits. It's not just tourism numbers. You could have a lot of tourists that aren't consuming that much, you see, or you could have uh, too, too few tourists that are consuming too much because they're all using mega yachts or whatever, right? I've been in places like that where you know the, the consumption is high even if the tourism is a little lower, right? So it isn't just about tourism numbers, it's about actually connecting the consumption of resources, and that includes your socio-cultural and historical resources, all right? Because if you suddenly deluge your sense of who you are with too many people like Amsterdam, I mean, they basically just had a party culture there. They couldn't live their lives normally anymore. That's a consumption. That's a form of consumption. It's just a form of consumption of culture and, and without the understanding or respect that's required. So that's what led to the second publication. Uh, it was actually invited to be done based on my book by the Travel Foundation, who we still work with, and I partnered with Cornell on this, which was golden because it was a difficult thing to write. But they said, take this question of consumption and take it to another level. So we did. And what we found out is, is that we only were measuring as a society worldwide uh, a certain number of things related to tourism, like how many people, again, are transported from place to place, or you know how much, if, you know, say water, or energy, or waste uh, that might be generated. But what we really don't know is all the things on the right, um, and and those things, like your ecosystems, uh, certainly biodiversity. We had no idea how much tourists were impacting our biodiverse resources. And in many places in the world, we had no idea how we were going to make this transition to renewable energy, which by the way is another huge accomplishment for you guys. You might be the only place I've been that has that actually worked out. Your energy, your renewable energy resources, that's extremely unusual. So, so the question is, how do you account for these things that were never accounted for before? All right, so what we found in that publication was is that destination costs, in other words, the cost for tourists, for servicing that tourist, it gets uh, higher and higher the more demand there is on the destination. So the more tourists you have, the more waste that's you know generated, the more water that's used, all those things, okay? And unless you know how much is being actually consumed, your taxpayers, your local taxpayers, pay that bill. And we, in, in our community, uh, our, our business, our, I think Brad, is Brad here? He was the one that brought this up. Yeah, at any rate, one of your stakeholders brought this up, that in fact, you don't know how much your tourists are using of the resources that you need on the island, and you do need to know. And that is actually something that we found in our research. Um, that especially islands actually have this problem where you have a small base of residents, right? And you have a large number of people that come in on a seasonal basis. It's very expensive that from an infrastructure perspective to service that, right? <laughs> so you have to think about what is that cost? What is that costing you? Because otherwise it will continue to get out of control, okay? So, this gets into a difficult topic, which is taxes. Uh, right now, you know, tourists pay taxes, and a portion of that is distributed back to your tourism council, and some of it to the town council, right? But what you don't know is actually 
what we call the actual cost of your tourist. And what I understand is, is that you need to know that in order to ultimately understand how you're gonna pay for tourism. And that can be actually changed. A lot of places are starting to do that, and I'm gonna give you some examples. This is where it gets more detailed than I usually do. So, um, in New Zealand, granted, a popular place uh, with uh, beautiful resources, um, they found that the taxes that they were collecting were actually inadequate to the task of protecting the place which they're passionate about, just like you. Um, and they were very worried about ultimately having a problem if they allowed those trends to continue. So they got ahead of the curve and they put a new $23 entry tax on visitors that doesn't just go to, it goes to the protection of local resources and infrastructure. Those are the two missing pieces and that's how they decided to solve that. Their goal was to protect New Zealand's reputation as a world-class experience and fund vital infrastructure. So uh, one of their ministers said that they were concerned and they wanted to really make sure, and I know you all are passionate about this too, that as their visitor numbers rise, we must ensure that the tourism industry is part of the solution, and I believe it can be. That's one thing I want to assure you. It's not that we're talking about stopping tourism here or trying to even make it lower. It's trying to look at how to rebalance it so that it is truly actually contributing to the conservation of your place and the infrastructure of your place, or it can potentially devalue it, okay? That's the problem. You, you start seeing people, and I've seen this here, I really think I have, where people expect things to come free and easy, and they don't care so much about the place, right? And I've heard in our town hall meetings, people say, we don't want visitors that don't care about our place. Well, so how do you get that equation back, right? But Part of it is making sure that everyone is paying what you know really it costs to, to maintain the place. If you think about it as business, and I like to use this uh, metaphor, if you only, you know, let's say you had a factory and you never maintained your factory, you would ultimately devalue your product. Your destination is actually a factory. It's generating a lot of revenue for all of you. So you have to put money back into it. It's just, it's just what it is. So Iceland is my other example. Um, very interesting country in that, of course, they didn't have much tourism, they really promoted it, um, and then they, and they, gave, they gave actually discounts on their taxes for businesses to, uh, and tourists to come there, and then by 2018, <laughs> this is too much, right? They, they overdid it, and actually Iceland is the source of the term over tourism. A reporter that went there, you know, actually used the term when they went to Iceland. Um, so uh, tourism was a growing percentage of their total revenue and GDP, uh, but they really wanted to rein it back in. So they took away those tax discounts, first of all, and then they also created these things, which I think are quite relevant for you. They created a new long-term tourism policy framework. I know it sounds like a lot of words, but, but uh, I think you need this. Um, and with a strong focus on sustainability, and they published that in 2019, they looked at what it was gonna take to assess environmental impacts and the status of the protected areas. You have all of this land in trust. I'm not familiar with your budgetary instruments for that, so I can't speak to it, but it could be that you need more funding to protect all that land that you have protected now. Uh, so those are things to consider. In Iceland, they were very concerned about that. And then, of course, this question of infrastructure, again, they saw that their small population could not afford to subsidize tourist use of infrastructure. So they had to rebalance the finance of all those three things. So in the end, Iceland is of course a bigger place, but I, you know, I've also spoken in British Columbia. I just missed the chance to go to Iceland to speak. The pandemic was just hitting, so I 
I was going through, right as they were launching their framework. Uh, but nonetheless, I was in British Columbia right before, uh, and they're doing the same thing. What they've done, and I'm excited about this, is they're creating these small destination management units with young people all over. I, I sat with some of them out there in Victoria who are now being reassigned. They're tra being trained uh, to do more of this kind of science-based monitoring uh, so that we can capture the tipping points on all of these questions. So that's what Iceland is doing. I've had my students work in Iceland as well. So it's quite exciting. It, you know, it's all about kind of changing some of the training as well, which is why I'm so involved in education now, so that young people can help with this process of you know, really delivering on these new metrics. And that includes uh, reduction of carbon emissions. So that, um, if you want to just look at a basic list of the things that need to be considered, this was the one I made up when I first did my book. You have to have the vision, uh, which some of you mentioned, you've got to have this vision. You have to document the existing development trends, which even that is an issue, right? You don't have the proper metrics on your tourists. Uh, you have to look at the tourism threats when it comes to these items, um, and then ultimately come up with a strategy to pay for what you are not maybe paying for now, using a surtax or an additional form of tax. So I am not advocating changing your tax system uh, as it exists now, but once you do all of these formulas, you may have to, you have to see what, what comes out of it. So I just want to reinforce that Block Island has a unique set of assets that you have done a really, I mean, wonderful job of protecting here. But you are running out of resources. When I go to this beach, I myself see all the people walking through the, not with their dogs, but just walking through the, the, the breeding birds without any real understanding of maybe they shouldn't be doing that. And the seals are coming in and people are crowding around them. So, you know, there's just a lack of personnel to do anything about it. I mean, who's going to do something about it? There's, it's really very difficult. So, so we're going to have to see, well, what would be a good system for that? And then also, of course, your cultural heritage and all the things that your citizens have done. It's amazing. I just went to the new lighthouse restoration. I mean, amazing. But it's also, you have to recognize it's your generational change that's happening here. And a lot of these things that were accomplished by the current and past generations are, may not be possible for the next generation, right? They may not be able to be equally committed to some of these topics unless you retool the system, right? So that's, that's one of my concerns being here. So what are the measurements that you need? This is a generic list, obviously. Uh, historic city centers, your monuments, your vital ecosystems, and your socio-cultural systems all need to be protected by these new uh, tipping point systems of management. Uh, and then, like all monitoring, you involve local participation to review that and ultimately do regular monitoring in the future. So it's, you know, there's a lot of challenges for you all right now. You're not in an emergency situation is the good news. So it, you have time to think about it. It's not like you have to, like Hawaii, where you know, people are just probably would be outside right now with protest signs or something. You know, it would, it, that's my understanding. Uh, so um, you have some time to consider this. Um, but overall, our conclusions from all of the research since I started in 2010 through now confirm that you don't protect your natural and cultural sites, uh, visitors will be less satisfied. If you do, they'll be more satisfied and they will be willing to pay more. So, so this is, you know, this a basic formula. So in terms of how uh, you might want to manage in the future, this is part of my standard presentation. Um, it's a little small. Um, yeah, where's that? Let me make it slow. Oh, yeah. Okay. So maybe I can stand back a little. Yeah. So on this side here, 
Um, you have what you have now with the Tourism Council. All right, this is a typical role for any Tourism Council. Over here, what we're saying is with the new systems, you're going to have to have cooperation, more cooperation with the local authorities, all right? And they're going to have to manage some of the stakeholder input on the local citizen needs and potentially do the monitoring of the consumption because they're in charge of the utilities, right? So it depends on the place, but this is a standard chart that we've been using just to get people to start to imagine how this could work. So, and then, as I said, I, I'm very interested in using greenhouse gas emissions as a form of measuring consumption. And we did a research project at Harvard, it was the last one I did there, we're still carrying out some student work with this, to help local governments to understand the unmeasured impacts of tourism called the invisible burden. It turns out that greenhouse gas emissions are really coming out of almost every aspect of the invisible burden. They're coming out of not only just say uh, your transport and your hotels, but it's also coming out of your 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 waste waste management, for example. And all of those have greenhouse gas emissions. And we tested a system and they basically found that if you can use that as a proxy for uh, all of these types of issues that actually, in other words, one spreadsheet uh, with all of the greenhouse gas emissions can cover all aspects of direct and indirect impacts of tourism. And it, our conclusions were that you can actually use that for reporting to your regional authorities, like in your case, the state of Rhode Island. The state of Rhode Island is definitely, I don't, I haven't studied it, but they're definitely gonna have a climate action plan if they don't already, which is gonna say that all you know, industry has to lower its greenhouse gas emissions. So what our tool is being tested to do is to help tourism authorities together with local governments to use this kind of measurement to tell you how to find those tipping points. And we're, we're still testing it at this time, but it, it's, you know, it's looking good. So, I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, here's just, it's kind of a laundry list, but it's a list of things that you need to consider. It's a review, and you'll be tested later. <laughs> um, so, infrastructure review. I've talked about that a lot. Um, your tax structure, I also talked about that. Um, certainly the development of a transportation plan sounds, everyone has talked about it, and I, I understand there's some tricky aspects to that, but it, it seemed clear to me that everyone at the town, camp, or town hall meetings we held were very much in favor of that, and this climate action plan that I'm talking about. And then, um, again, all of these things, as it was pointed out, have to coordinate with existing efforts that you, some of these things are happening in different departments, so those things all have to be sorted. But overall, as I said, you need to prioritize what is your product, it is your place, and it has to be, you know, viably funded, and so the tax revisions that you may consider could support some of the things that you're recommending. <coughs> like guiding or ambassadors, but that came out. I mean, that may be right now, I can see you envisioning that already as a kind of a, uh, you know, like volunteer position. I don't see it that way. I think that ambassadors should be paid um, and that they could be a terrific position that could help with some of these issues of getting the right ethic instilled uh, throughout Block Island, wherever people are visiting, there would be ambassadors. I, I like. I thought of that idea too, so I was really interested that everyone locally was thinking of that. Uh, it's because you're a small enough place with obvious places to put ambassadors, right? And then the management and long-term climate resilience. Those are, you know, like heavy burdens, and I'm sure your city council will want to think about how much it's going to cost in order to actually cover those uh, considerations. But one of the things, of course, I said in the beginning is that you have to think long term and you should not just tie visitor volume to measured impact. That's what Hawaii, that's what Amsterdam's trying to do. 
I don't think so. What happens, and we know this from the protected area community, that they tried that back in the 60s. And you know, setting limits of that nature on places does not work. Uh, people find a way around it and you end up with a lot of law breaking even, right? So you have to tie it to something such as, I think, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, that's what my research is about, uh, but to measure impacts and then call for the mitigation of those measured impacts in order to address the volume that you have. All right. So um, I'll be passing out the quiz. Somebody's got a question. <laughs> Head back there. Any questions? Yep. Where's the start? Who has to first make the commit a commitment that basically puts enough meat behind the, the ideas? I think a combination of the Tourism Council with the, the City Council. The local authority in my, my language. <laughs> yeah. Now I remember where I met you on a walk, right? Didn't we meet on a walk? We did. Yeah. Sorry. And I, I, I kept I looking you, at you like. <laughs> I marked you on my calendar with a question mark. I wasn't sure. Anyway, um, because I am assuming most of us are not experts in doing this, and we have a zillion committees on this island already, yeah. it is very hard to find volunteers. It would make seem to make sense to me that the first attempt be to hire a consulting firm that actually does that nitty gritty work, all that research, and then presents it to the, the town council. Mm. Because that information will then inform us what we can do on our own from there on in. But I would love to see experts handle the nitty gritty math and science of it first. Mm -hmm. That's my suggestion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Dory Holman. I'm the current president of the Block Island Conservancy, which is one of the many organizations that work to protect the space here on Block Island. I do feel that we're a little bit closer to that tipping point, maybe, than you might indicate, in that we also are kind of a ground zero for climate change with sea level rise and and, and the other impacts that come with that. So with that looming for us, um, does that change the way you might think about mm. like how we should proceed? Because it isn't mm. really just about tourism. We do have this other mm. huge issue to confront. Well, like I said, the two can be tied together according to our research. And I, I let you judge the urgency of it. Um, and, and how much you want to act. Uh, I generally find that there has to be an internal dialogue about that. Uh, and I can't really interfere with that. Uh, but I, I, uh, I see it as being urgent everywhere. But I also see, because of the vastness of the problem in my world, I can't expect immediate change, but that doesn't mean that I personally don't think it's very urgent. But what I would say that I would repeat is that you are a very conscientious group of people, um, and therefore I feel as if you will get ahead of the curve, while many places may not. Yeah. I mean, I as I'm seeing how I get on. Um, as Dory said, I think there are a number of people who are here who feel that we have at the tipping point, mm -hmm. that we have come close to what they're doing in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. There is a real feeling among some of us that enough is enough. Mm -hmm. You know, and you've heard, I know, of moped, moped, but it really is not moped. It's this over-tourism that 
I bet you many of the people here are feel it uh, and see it and don't even come into town um, in the summer. Um, I mean, we're we are at a tipping point here. Yeah. Well, I I've been here the first week of August for six years, and yeah. I personally have seen a difference myself too. Um, I don't know if this is so much of a question as an observation, but I do know, as being on the board of the Tourism Council, I've had people approach me and say, don't advertise anymore. Stop it. We, there's enough people. There's already too many people here. Um, however, the visitors drive our economic engine, so we, we do need the visitors. But I think many, many of us and many of my neighbors kind of feel helpless um, and, and don't have any control over who's coming and how many people are coming and what are they doing when they're here. Um, and this has been some great information and I think everybody here has some passion for our future, but, and I think the first question I asked it like, how do we take this feeling of, of helplessness and not being in control and the passion for preserving our future and our future for our children, like, how do we get the ball rolling? Because it seems overwhelming. Um, you know, these concepts are great, but um, I, I've been on this board and been on other ones, and there's a lot of issues facing our community, and we talk about some of the same things for years, and, and I feel like sometimes here we are a year later having the same conversation. Um, yeah. So, so where do we go? Well, as I said, I have, I mean, as a consultant, first of all, and also as an academic, um, I like to follow all of these things and try and find the thing that I think for any one community might help you to achieve what you're trying to achieve, right? I myself think that a climate action plan would fit you uh, because, but you know, you could choose another type of plan. I was saying to Jessica, it could be that you need a tourism policy framework in which you would then go through this vision process. As some of you said, you need that vision first. And I can't disagree with that. Uh, but that takes a lot of time to create your vision. If you want a quicker thing, I would you know, right now they're going to Glasgow, all the international organizations are saying that tourism authorities around the world should commit to climate action plans. And, you know, I have to use a lot of social media myself and, and I hit like every time I see that. Because I think that these climate action plans, according to our own research, can take most of these tipping points into account. Not all of them because the problem with the climate action plan, it's not so strong on the socio-cultural anxiety question, the sense of your culture being consumed, right? But it also will enable you, and I, they would have to be studied, but I'm assuming that it would enable you to work more closely with your Rhode Island legislature because all of the data would plug right in. This has been the problem with what tourism authorities that are trying to help have made, in my opinion, mistakes in the past. They, they you know, hire in a consultant who then does just a bunch of data for them, and then the minute the consultant leaves, nobody is adequately in charge of how to keep up that system, nor is it matching up with other systems, say, at the state level. So when we did our research, you know, since I've been around for 25 years already, I was gonna have nothing to do with that, you see? And uh, so that's where I was like, look, the world is looking at trying to solve the climate problem. Tourism is 10% of the global economy. I did not use that, but that's that's gen the general quote, the term. What it is here doesn't, well, do you know the, the actual percent? We don't because we don't know the number of visitors. But at any rate, I'm sure it's much harder than that. Oh, I'm sure it's like 20, 30 percent here, right? Yeah. So, so you, for that reason, it is more urgent. Yes, because the one of the things we look at is how dependent 
is are you on tourism as as a level that that actually tells you how urgent the problem is the more dependent you are right so that's why if you want to ask me if you want to act you get your local authority to work with your tourism council and the quickest thing would be a climate action plan that would have to be studied a bit more but that would be my because of all the research i've done on it yeah you say climate action plan, but can you give us the nitty gritty on a climate action plan? What does that entail? Because I think it's such a broad term that might be applicable to some place like New Zealand or all of Europe, but we're 10 square miles. So when you say climate action plan, what are specific things or suggestions or examples that can be implemented? And knowing that long-term planning like right you know we're looking at water consumption you know right now that was i think a recent article in the block island times there's concern with our resource of water that would be part of it so yeah, would the the action plan include supporting and 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 educating conservation of water or you know can do you have any examples of well the way i see it is based on the tool that we created you measure water, waste, electricity, um, and transport, and look at the both direct and indirect impacts from tourism via the greenhouse gas emission, and you end up with a formula of how much each tourist generates in greenhouse gas emissions. And that's your science-based tipping point. It informs you how to you know, see how much the tourist is costing you from the point of view of infrastructure, and at the same time, it looks at how are you going to mitigate it. Now, the mitigation costs money, but the you know, it, first of all, you could look at tax, but don't forget. And I spent a lot of time on this. There's a lot of climate finance out there now, and there's going you know, if they ever get that stuff through the legislature in Washington, there's going to be more. Um, so the idea would be that also you could. Now you've already, in many ways, solved your electricity problem by, from the point of view of GHG emissions, which is amazing. But nonetheless, all these other questions could ultimately be looked at in terms of how you want to act based on the data to fix your infrastructure and your transport. Things that have come out over and over again as being your problems. Yeah. Um, I know this is about tourism, but I think the other issue that affects both our climate impacts and infrastructure is housing development mm -hmm. and hotel development. And that impacts our resources enormously. Mm -hmm. um, and I think right now we're at a certain point with that. Well, that it's, would relate to the hotel infrastructure. It's not a separate no, the hotel infrastructure would be part of that. When we did the original right. test, we looked at all of the hotel as the source of consumption per you know per tourist per room so that all comes up in the same spreadsheet so that you and can see that with housing and how large they are how much electricity they use waste management that could be included if uh, that's called boundaries and you have to decide what you know but you're right some i think it was martha that said to me all of these uh what you call uh rental units so that can be measured absolutely um, through the same system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, it doesn't solve all problems, but certainly anything that involves resource use and, that, and hotels and rental housing does. And, and housing building. Yeah, like actual second homes never took taken that on, but don't forget you're on an island. It, it, I get worried when I'm talking about that in other places that, you know, where's the boundary going to be? You know, but in your case, you have a boundary. It's the island, so that's uh, that would be a decision that your city council would have to make as to what to measure. That's all part of the process. But you have control of that. Uh, the researchers don't tell you what to do; they tell you what they can do, and then you decide where to put the boundaries. Yeah. yeah. This isn't so much of a question, but just for folks in the room, we are having our annual meeting on Sunday, yes, and we have a guest speaker coming um, to talk about uh, composting and waste management. We've been running a compost pilot on the island for the last three years. 
and our hope is to elevate it to more community municipal compost because our food waste is a gen is a is an overwhelming methane gas emitter and has a very high carbon footprint and it all moves from here by ferry to the Johnson landfill. Mm -hmm. So that's just something for our education and a potentially a, a project that we can look to help with. Yeah, what you in, in our results, um, you end up say seeing that problem in a pie chart, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it might be higher because of the methane uh, that will accelerate or, or make your greenhouse gas emissions higher as a result of not having composting. So it gives you that feedback mechanism, <laughs> as I was saying, so that you can then look at the science-based tipping points, monitor that, and then as a community, ultimately decide. And maybe get financing. Don't forget, I've really been focusing on that finance. But, you know, no, I, I have been. I, I believe it. So come on Sunday to learn about compost. <laughs> so was that an example of an implementable action that would fall under climate? Yes. You made it your climate? Yes. Okay. So composting. End, correct. Yes. Okay. It would, okay. Eliminating. Yeah. Like finding know, ways to deal with food Eliminating. Waste. Yeah. Plastic waste, eliminating styrofoam waste, yeah. things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. I think that's what was kind of my like something that's tangible that I can. No, thank you for wrap making me do around, that. I, I don't know how to measure greenhouse gases. Yeah, I, I yeah. often get that comment, and I, I always so thanks for filling in that gap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think I understand. You say that you use as a metric to judge stresses on resources, mostly for the greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. But that's what our research at Harvard was, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. do you have any insight into how to measure impacts on resources in the community where you live? You know, that's not, that's not the, the metric. I'm thinking of, you know, certainly, I mean, I, water use. We've seen that in the paper recently. You know, stresses on resources like uh, public safety, health care, right. those things which are not directly transferable into emissions environmental concerns, which are important, but a separate, very important resource group of an island. We do I mean, include, we do include water use because of water treatment, and that, so it all comes in under the same framework, but not anything else you mentioned. Okay. Uh, so, and that's where I originally said you might need an action plan. I, you know, I said to Jessica, we have a student, you know, that, is available uh, that could be supervised to help with what I would call an action plan because uh, that takes more, it's like a whole process of consultation that you need in order to make sure you're including all of the pressure points that are beyond the climate uh, action plan. Yes. So that, that gets into a wider set of considerations. Yeah, because I'm more, yeah. So what I've done as a professional is try to bring in, like I even brought in, you know, a guy from Amsterdam who's a university professor over there uh, to try and advise, because what we need is tipping points on what I would call socio-cultural issues, which is much more difficult. It's not, a, it's not as scientific, right? So, uh, so we're still developing mechanisms for that. Uh, but you know it, it's possible to do, but it's a little bit more just based on community will, right? Than on and what what I find, for example, is that the community has to s decide in those cases what is acceptable and what is not acceptable by way of a burden on their society. But it's not like measuring climate. Like I said, it is complicated. I've never said it was simple, right? So, so uh, yeah, we agree that that has to be included. But we don't, I can't say we have like something straight out of the desk drawer to, to put to it. I'm not sure anyone does. Yeah. Well, we'll take the students. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, to go back to the first or second question, what can we do? I mean, we need to do something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, consulting, I mean, obviously my company does consulting. It's just how much that would cost versus having a student, which is why I 
I said, you know, maybe that could help on the cost. <laughs> my, my company would still have to be involved in that, but the student could do more of the legwork. That's why, because I know nobody's set up with budgets for this kind of thing, so that's why I try to keep that in mind. Yeah. But wouldn't, if we have, we have existing tax revenues, we, we have existing records, or we should, that I think would be measurable mm -hmm. as a starting point when it comes to not only the tax revenues that the town gets, tourism council gets, but number of house rentals, mm -hmm. number of rooms, how often they're rented. Um, we should have boat counts. We should have gallons of septage from those boats that are offload. You know, we have, I think, a number of metrics or data that can start to at least get a trend for the past 10 years and actually measure, because I think when the term tipping point is used, I think that is more of a, I don't think, I think it's more of an atmosphere than it is a number. Okay, yeah, no, I, I think there's, like I think there's a lot point. of anxiety, right. particularly that. after last year mm -hmm. where, you know, Jess pointed out during a, tour, a, a town council meeting that had Block Island is set up the best for tourism during a pandemic, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. We are the event, mm -hmm. where Newport isn't. Newport is an event destination, so they got crushed. Mm -hmm. We didn't. You really didn't. And that created a tremendous amount of anxiety within the community, you know, and I think heightened everybody's awareness of tourism and, you know, the term tipping point and what is too much and I think it's a conversation that I, that's been attempted over the years, but you have to have a starting point. And I think we do have some of the the data. We just have to have someone willing to aggregate it all and have a, and start that conversation again. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think we are. I think point. the islands are mm -hmm. well ahead of the curve of a lot of places, particularly when it comes to conservation. Yeah. You know that vision years and years ago. Yeah. You know we have a finite resource 10 square miles of dirt we know how many buildings can go up we can calculate that yeah. we can come up with a 10-year plan and a quote-unquote build out or where we want to stop or where those boundaries are we just have to have the leadership to basically make that a priority this is why i'm telling you you are a very practical group of people and you understand the challenge and you're making very good recommendations mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and just to note that about a month ago, Respect BI spread out all over the island and counted cars, mopeds, bikes, pedestrians, sort of at strategic places. And I haven't seen the data yet, but it was shocking to see how much traffic there is. We were, two of us were right at the corner, you know, right at the bottom of this driveway. And it was unbelievable to actually count it. Mm -hmm. And everybody was doing it at the same time during two hours. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the summer weekend? No. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't our, our highest traffic weekend? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as I understood that you didn't recommend that a bit of cap on tourism is a solution. So can you just give an example of, of effective mitigation strategies? Yeah, well, kind of what New Zealand and Iceland have done, it, it's kind of a demand, uh, you, you, you slow demand by paying for the cost of the tourist. Mm -hmm. So it, it does mean surcharging, you know, your, your way into, and, and you can, what, you know, we, we did study demand management and we wrote it up in the Invisible Burden. We mainly wrote that up for monuments uh, but you can, there's simple algorithms now that would enable charging different surcharges at different times of year. But isn't that just another way of limiting numbers by making more expensive? Well, the reason I think it's not is because you're going to be using real data as opposed to like just setting artificial caps. And that's where you run into those problems is artificial caps people don't respect them. It's a question of respect, that people don't respect artificial caps and they find ways to cheat. And that's been found for you know, decades. 
Uh, so, but if everyone agrees on the metrics within, say, the island, and, and, and then convey why. I mean, it, it does have to be, I didn't see a huge you know, upset from New Zealand and Iceland, actually. The place that did it first was uh, Mallorca, and, and they are a mass tourism destination that were the first ones to do this. And they had a huge protest because so many big companies sent tourists there, but they went ahead and they have raised hundreds of millions of dollars at one or two euros per person on a surcharge that's all going to conservation and infrastructure. And I recently had their representative on a call and uh, for, you know, like experts, and she's saying it's working great. Uh, so there even, sometimes there are protests, that's the thing you want to avoid. You don't want to create a negative impression about what you're doing, and I'm trying to protect you from that. Yeah. In my order, did it slow down the number of tourists coming in? Yeah, I haven't checked those numbers. Um, I can't answer that definitively. It's a good question, but uh, it was such a low fee. Like, look at the fees that New Zealand is charging, mm -hmm. much higher. So I, I kind of doubt it. At first, the tour operators that were sending all those tourists to Mallorca uh, said they wouldn't go, but they, I think they did anyway. Uh, I, I'm not sure the volume went way down, with, but that was a very low surcharge. So what's your feeling about the surcharge? If it's a higher surcharge, would you cut down the number of people? Probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank it seems you. to be really high. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. Um, one last thing. I do think some of the messaging, like the how to love Block Island poster that Jess made. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people that reaches, but if you can get positive, respectful, educational messages out mm -hmm. through marketing yeah. in kind of a fun way, hopefully that's a step in the right direction. Yeah, I think so. It, it, it makes the Tourism Council a partner in the process, first of all, and second of all, when everyone, you know, when you have, you know, all of the, you, your leadership behind an idea, exactly, you can then convey that in, a, in an effective way that, also, I just was reading before I came here too, with very large companies like Booking.com, for example, and they all created this uh, organization called Travelist, and they're all saying that, you're talking like Google even now, is saying, that the demand for more sustainable tourism is as high as they've ever seen. And they're starting to put on the search engines when a place is doing, it's more for businesses right now, I'd like to say for those nations, but overall the idea is that they're starting to flag on search engines when there is sustainability metrics available. So I think that you will see if it's because you've done so much already, it's just that a portion of your market has no idea what you're doing, right? But if they had the help of major booking engines, you know, that, that could be a way of drawing attention to what you're doing in a very positive way. And it could end up being a better part. Yeah. Oh, I think where she's back from. <laughs> I don't have that data, it's a good question. I think it's really early if you look at these places that are doing it and then the pandemic hit right away. <coughs> so, you know, like Iceland and New Zealand did this right before the pandemic hit. So only Mallorca would have that data because they started in 2016. But that's really the three places that I can cite right now um, that have moved ahead with this. But the OECD, you know, which is the, the, the chart I use, the, they, they, they track this through their policy unit and that would be like an easy source of info if there's anything more on that. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. 
Thank you. Is that very much a follow up to what Kimberly just asked about? Um, one of the problems here in July and August, which is the main seasonal, now it's really from May to October, but the worst is July and August, is you have each day thousands, literally, not just a few hundred, you have thousands of people, we call them day trippers, who come over, mostly local, remote islands, uh, who really tax the resources of the island. They get drunk, their ballards, seem to allow them to do as much as they want. Uh, they rent mopeds, they get drunk, there's accidents. It creates a tremendous uh, burden on the resources here. They don't really add to the island. They really take away from it. So I'm trying to figure out all of what you said, which I really appreciate. I think it's brilliant in many ways. But it had a, at, just as Surtax saying, it's going to cost you $5 to come to Block Island. These 20 some year olds will pay five bucks and they'll still get drunk and they'll still ruin the resources and ruin the island. So I don't know how, I, I don't have the answer. I'm not asking for an answer, but I think one of the frustrations many of us have here, and I see what you know Jessica's done when she's showing us the brochures of the advertisements that's put online on, on social media about Respect Block Island, which is great, but you're gonna always have, and it's not, you know, just a few people you deal with. How do you deal with thousands of people daily on the ferries that are, they add more and more ferries every year from London, everywhere else, to uh, of course, in point years to come here. How do you deal with that kind of problem? Yeah. It's not the rest of the year. It's right. primarily yeah. mid-June to mid-September. I know, I, I, I observed the same and, and pondered it as well because of that particular market. They're, they're not even likely to be paying attention to that kind of market, which, you know, is just a reality. Uh, but it's not, it's not your fault. Jessica's in the county. I mean, the responsible type of people, unfortunately, read the responsible marketing, right? right? right. It's just a reality. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, this kind of, like the, what Amsterdam had, I mean, it was really bad. I never went there that time here, but certainly it had the same problem. Um, and so, you know, cracking down on these kinds of uh, behaviors, I, again, uh, these are things that would, even I, after all these years, would have to go through and just see who has the best, you know, system. And I think Amsterdam might be, like I said, I have run in someone that I, I really trust, and he's monitoring the Amsterdam situation as part of his university work. So that kind of thing is even I, like this is 2.0 for me too. There's a lot of things happening right now that are challenging my even my resources, which are pretty pretty strong. Uh, so I think uh, all of us, to a certain extent, have to learn as we go on some of those challenges, including me. Yeah.